<laughs> All right. Welcome to Let Freedom Ring <clears throat> on the live stream. We haven't done a live stream in quite some time. Uh, I can have whatever I want in the background. We're not in the studio. Nick has no control over what goes on on the live stream. So we're, we're really happy about that. But uh, I want to welcome my guest, good friend of mine, Daisy Rivera. Daisy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, no. It's great that we can make this work. I know you recently had had an injury um, and we couldn't do the studio. That would have been difficult uh, right. to do right now. <clears throat> but uh, h- how are you doing with that? Are you, f- you feeling any better? Yeah, it's it's not as bad as it was the first few days. Um, you know, I'm off my feet for two months. No driving, no bearing any weight. Um, pretty bruised still, but the cast is helping. Hey, I, I hear you. And, and those kind of injuries are always so tough, especially when you can't be on your feet. So, um, but let's get to know you a little bit. Um, where are you from? Where did you grow up? So I'm Puerto Rican, um, born in Boston, uh, raised in Mass. Um, yeah, and then until I was 18, and then after that, I kind of moved around. And I moved to Miami, Alaska, back to Mass, back and forth, <laughs> Rhode Island, <laughs> Washington, you know, back to Mass. Yeah, you've been you've been in many different places. How did you mm-hmm. did because I, I have to assume New England wasn't something on your radar. Yeah, no, I was like ready to get out. <laughs> yeah. I was so ready. So I um I grew up or I went to high school and all of that in a town in I guess South Shore Mass or Southern Mass. Okay. Um, not far from Rhode Island. But it was a pretty racist town. <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> That's never and, good. <laughs> and yeah, and and you know, I think I was one of the handful of minorities there, um, and had lots of really negative experiences. And so I was like, I'm getting out of here as soon as I graduate high school, and I'm gonna go to the most like diverse place I can find, which was Miami. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Now, what town are you living in right now? I, I believe I'm, I'm trying to get... Where is it? Tingsboro, Mass. Oh, Tingsboro. So, yeah, right over the border. So, yeah. definitely can make time for us people in New Hampshire, I, I take yeah. it. <laughs> um, now, this is, a, this is a question, loaded question here. What are three things that everybody should know about you? Oh, man. Um... I think music runs through my veins. I just, I love dancing. Um, obviously can't do much of that right now. <laughs> um, but it's just always that something that's just kind of like, it's there. Um, I am, let me see. Just uh, honestly, like I'll try anything. Like I'm pretty adventurous, you know what I mean? Um, and love you know, trying new things, uh, trying new cultures, new activities, whatever it is, you know, I'm always down to try something new. Um, and I'm a big advocate for social justice, human rights. Um, that's something I'm really passionate about. And I think I have been since I was young, probably because of the way I grew up, um, you know, and the experiences I had and things I witnessed at such an early age um, was always a big, big advocate for that. Hey, no, and that's a good thing. I know we've had conversations about the overturning uh, with the Supreme Court. Um, very shocking. I never really thought we would actually live in a time where, where something like that yeah. would happen. Um, but yeah. I'm with you. Yeah, yeah that 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 was, ugh, it was it was quite shocking and um, and really sad, honestly, because you know it, it's healthcare. It well. It's healthcare. It's all about healthcare and women's rights to healthcare and access to safe healthcare because, you know, um, all it is is going to raise the stakes in terms of danger and for others. And so um, I'm hoping that somehow that can be reversed. We'll see what happens. Yeah. It's crazy because, you know, it's like they're it's not going to stop abortion. It's going to stop legal right. ones. And this is why right. this was overturned in the first place, you know. Right. And I've had so many patients 
that have experienced the um, unsafe back alley abortions, um, you know, they've had trauma or whatever the case might be, but um, it has a lot of negative um, health implications. No, 100% agreed. It, it, we'll see what happens. I don't think it's going to affect any of the states that we are in, in here in New England. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, I think it's going to affect uh, people in poverty. And that that's yeah. that's a big thing there. Um, mm-hmm. So we'll see what happens if it gets overturned, but very, very unfortunate. Right, right. Um, now, sticking with the theme of the show, which I do need to put this on a T-shirt at some point because I say this every time I ask this question, and it's a loaded question. And like you said, you've you've dealt with uh, prejudice in your life. Um, you, you fight, uh, you know, for equality for people to have rights. It doesn't always work out that way. Well, what is it? What does it mean to you to be an American? It's funny because that is that is a really loaded question. So, I. I was thinking about that. And I used to work as a teacher's aide years and years and years ago in Alaska. And we went, we had teacher conference, like, um, you know, basically training days where we'd sit in different workshops and kind of professional development and all of that. And one of the teachers um, that were running the workshops asked, like they were trying to demonstrate you know, a way to um, teach vocabulary, like something simple, right? And we were basically pretending to be the students and we were given a word and we had to write down our definition of the word and the word was colony. And so (laughs) I was like, you know, everyone wrote something different, but something to affect a to the fact of like an ant colony, like people working together, you know, to build something. And um, (laughs) I was so shocked because (laughs) my answer was completely different. My response was, you know, a colony is a place that has been taken over (laughs) by (laughs) a bigger power, right? And kind of forced to be a part of it. So, you know, I think I I looked at it from the perspective of like Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States, right? Um, And so I thinking, you know, in the bigger picture, Puerto Ricans that live on the island are not allowed to vote. Which I still don't quite understand uh, at this point. Yeah. Right. So that's a huge issue. And it's like, well, to me, I've always been Puerto Rican, and I'm obviously also American. Um, but it's crazy to think that that being American for a Puerto Rican dip- varies depending on where they live. Um, you know, and so, but, you know, also looking at the bigger picture, I work with refugees and I work with immigrants. I'm also very privileged in that I'm an American compared to other Latinos and Latinas who don't have citizenship. Um, So it's kind of, it's one of those like very layered things, um, you know, that it gets complicated, I think. There's no simple answer to that, you know, and you're, and you're right. Um, You know, in Puerto Rico, I think they've, they do vote in the primaries, right? But not in the general election, which I'm always like, how does that even make sense? If you're going to vote in one, they should vote in both. It makes no sense. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but no, no, that's a great answer. And like I said, it means, you know, everybody's, you know, the American experience is so different for, for everybody. Yeah. You know, it depends on the situation that you're in. And uh, we we can't just say that everything's great. Right. You can't because it's not. <laughs> and yeah. if and if and if we do that, I do feel like we're we're losing what the whole American idea is. Right. right. 
So, and I do want to say anybody that's out there watching, if you do want to comment, you do need to comment either on YouTube or on my personal page for, or uh, I'm sorry, on the Let Freedom Ring page for whatever reason, for my personal page. If people are commenting that want to interact with us, uh, it doesn't work. And I'm not sure why. Uh, I have to have, I got to have the Let Freedom Ring uh, technology team look into that. But I do want to get into this. I want to talk about your career a little bit. Um, You have your doctorate in clinical psychology. Uh, uh, This is what you do every day. Um, how did you know that you wanted to get, get into, uh, the work of, of clinical psychology? So it's kind of funny because I was totally against it my whole life. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I thought I was going to be a lawyer. I had plans to be an attorney and then like senior year of high school, I decided, no, I'm going to do, um, you know, international relations and and kind of do something more at the international level in terms of law. Um, Because again, I was passionate about social justice, you know, human rights um, and diversity. And so I thought, oh, international is the way to go, right? Um, So I went to undergrad and um, had some of those experiences and I was really shocked because so in Miami, it was pretty, it was very diverse. And where I was living, you know, there were people from literally, I mean, every country you think of, and everyone was just so excited to meet each other and welcoming of each other. And so I thought that was great. And it was funny because I went to a mock UN reunion or, you know, meeting and it was so discriminatory oh, no. <laughs> it was in the same place. So I thought it was really odd. Um, you know, and I was wondering, I was thinking about, you know, okay, this is what I want to do. What's the best way to do it? I had conversations with people that had worked in the legal system and, and they kind of said that, you know, you kind of, if you're trying to fight the system or change the system, you're going to become you're from within the system you have to accept the fact that you're going to become a part of the problem right and that was really tough for me to kind of i guess swallow um um but you know so i had witnessed my brothers experience a lot of police brutality um and again i said i was kind of going that direction And then my um, oldest brother committed suicide. And so I took some time off and kind of, that's when I worked at the school. And when I was working with these kids, I was working with, you know, kids that were learning English as a second language and um, kids that were on the autism spectrum or had some behavioral issues um, and just, I don't know. I just realized, I think something clicked for me when I was working with kids where I was like, I think this is the way I can still achieve those goals of, you know, kind of advocating for human rights and social justice in a way where it could be more um, healing. Okay. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I mean, and it's like we all start off so young thinking we're going to do this and then we go in a different direction. Right. You know, when I was in college, I thought I was going to be so I thought I was going to be this teacher that was going to change the world. Then I got into it and I was like, uh, I don't even know if I want to do this anymore. So I, <laughs> I applaud you for staying the course and, 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 and taking it even to a better, you know, even in a better direction. Um, I have to ask this because it's pretty impressive. You have your doctorate. This is not something easy to do. Yeah. What went into that? What was like the hardest parts? I mean, you must have been putting in a lot of hours to make this work. Because I'm assuming you have a full-time job at the same time. Oh, more than that. So I was a single parent. So I, I got my master's as a single parent and my doctorate. Um, I had, because I have a PsyD and not a PhD, this ID is very like you have to do research, but you also have to do lots of clinical. So it was required to have an internship the entire duration of the program. 
Um, so like going into the program, you had to prove that you could get hired. <laughs> um, and you know, you had to have an internship. So I had an unpaid internship, full-time job. Jeez. And I was a single parent and full-time, um, you know, coursework, which was pretty intense. Um, I did not sleep much, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Um, but yeah, I think honestly, it was just determination. I was so damn determined to just make it happen. You know, um, I think honestly, the the juggling of schedules was probably one of the hardest things. Um, I had to write a dissertation or actually do research. Um, I did an international research study, um, which was written in three languages and oh, <laughs> very, very many pages. So um, that was also time consuming. But yeah, it's just all the balancing and juggling of everything. Now, like after, were you just like relieved? Or was, cause I mean, honestly, that's a lot to it just is. juggle. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, it felt weird. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, you know, so then I started, I was like, okay, well, uh, softball is something that I've always done. So I was, I've always been on a softball team, no matter where I've lived. Like first thing I do, I move somewhere new, find a softball team and just, <laughs> you know, that, that keeps me going. So, um, you know, I was doing softball. I was, so I was, well, after, after coursework is done, you have to do like a, a internship. So, so you're not even out of the woods at that point. Residency and postdoc, <laughs> and it, it isn't until you finish like the residency program or the AP internship and publish, you know, your dissertation or your research that you're done done. Um, but then after that, postdoc, and I I joined a running club. <laughs> I danced. I did Zumba. I did hiking. I did everything you could think of. Um, and then it was still odd to have that much time in my hands, so I went. And got myself a couple more jobs. Yeah, there you go. Now, I, I do want to add this question into it. What would you tell somebody going for their doctorate in the situation that you're in? Or, you know, obviously, it, it, they might not be a single parent. Maybe they have somebody else or whatever. But if you're going, you're probably working full time. Right. What's the best advice you could tell a doctorate student going for it? You know, um, I think one of the things make sure you prioritize you and not the workplace. So I, I remember I accepted an internship uh, once and um, because I made that commitment to, and I think I, I accepted that a little prematurely, but I made the commitment to the person I was speaking, you know, to the um, supervisor of the place, um, and because of that, I wanted to respect that. And so when, and it, but it was like two and a half hours away. Oh, geez. So, and okay, so now we're talking distance as yeah. well. <laughs> and that, oh, that's right. I was living in a different state of where I was yeah. coming to every day too. This is another thing, but, um, but then I was offered an internship 15 minutes away, but because I had given my word that I would, you know, um, go to the one that was two and a half hours away. I kept my word. I went there. Um, and when I got there, the supervisor was not even there. He had left. Oh, wow. And it was so not the same program. So I, it was kind of, a, you know, and then I was stuck at that point. Um, but I think it's okay to prioritize yourself. And, you know, I think sometimes um, as a student and you kind of forget that you can do that because you're not in a power position. Yeah. You know, um, but that, and just, if you could have a flexible job. That <laughs> <laughs> uh, makes sense. Yeah. They're going to have to work with you a, a little bit. Yeah. Um, which I understand now what, now on your, what's, what's your day to day look like now? Um, so I work at a clinic um, full time community health center. I'm also working as teaching faculty or adjunct faculty. 
nice. at um, my alma mater, mater um, William James College. So it's a graduate school. And so I teach in a few programs there. Um, yeah, and I do some consulting on the side every now and then. I consult with legal firms. Nice. Now, what is the the most rewarding part uh, of your job? Or any of them that you do do? Because I know you do multiple things. <laughs> um, you know, I think when you're in it, you don't really realize, like, the impact that you have on a person. Um, but when you kind of take a step back, or if you see, like, the progress that's been done, um, it's, I think it's really impactful and, and powerful to see the fact that you can have on someone and on somebody's life. Um, and then teaching, that's kind of, you know, that's something that I hadn't really noticed about teaching until I went to, um, uh, I went to this conference with a mentor of mine and the, basically it was kind of a reflection panel and circle and so the panel were all psychologists that were um had been in the fields for 50 plus years you know like they were seasoned psychologists and the topic was legacy and oh. so they just had to kind of go on like reflect basically each of them there were about six panelists um and they were all very like highly revered people um and so they just had to reflect on legacy and then the audience could reflect on their reflections. <laughs> and <laughs> it was really intense. Um, but as I was walking in with my mentor, I met like four or five people that she had taught multiple generations, right? And I was just like, it just baffled my mind. Like she has impacted so many people by just teaching, you know? Um, and so it's, yeah, it's just pretty incredible, um, the impact that you can have on someone, but also to be a part of somebody's healing. Is no, no, that's awesome. I mean, I, I feel like you're doing like God's work here, you know, but do you ever have patients or students come back and say, Hey, like you made a difference in my life or thank you for, you know, what you've yeah. done for me? Yeah, and that those are the moments. Like I, I had one of those moments a couple of weeks ago, um, where I had a student who's graduating who was like, "Hey, um, you know, I just want to invite you. Hey, Dr. Rivera, I wanted to invite you to my graduation party. I know I haven't really, you know, I know it's been a rough year for me, but thank you for everything, and you know, I've learned a lot from you. Those were one of the. That was one of the moments where I was like. Really, <laughs> you know, um, so it, it was really rewarding. Um, yeah. Now I got to ask, what's the most challenging part? Um, I deal with a lot of trauma. You know, um, I'm a trauma specialist, so that's <laughs> kind of where it goes. Um, but you know, I think to be honest, you know the patience and all of that, that's not the hard part. I think the difficult part is working within the system that, you know, there's only so much, you know, assistance in terms of some of their needs are very, you know, basic needs or, um, you know, very real, like tangible, like, you know, yeah, basic needs like housing and things like that, um, you know, and um, financial assistance and all of that, which is very difficult, um, you know, and if you don't have your basic needs met, it's hard to get where, you know, to heal anything else or, or to deal with anything else. Um, so, yeah, I think different systems work, different, you know, in different ways. And, um, yeah, I think that would be. The most challenging. I totally agree with that. I mean, if your basics aren't like, because I, I have a follow-up question that I'm asking you why mental health is important. And I, I think we all know why, mm -hmm. but I think you just brought up a, a very interesting point. If your basics aren't handled, can you handle your mental health? Mm -hmm. 
Do you know what I mean? Like that, I think that's something we don't take serious in this country. I think it's like a ripple effect. Right. You know, we don't healthcare. Well, we don't really care about that. If you have this, then great. Um, it almost gets to the point where it's like the only people that care about these people struggling are people like you. Because it's like, oh, yes, we want to take mental health seriously. But it's like, does anybody really? If mm-hmm. Again, if, you're, if your basics aren't met, how can you address that? Right. You know? Right. You know, and they, honestly, it should, you know, I think there's all, there's such a great divide between, oh, medical health and mental health, physical health and mental health. It's all the one and the same, you know, your brain is a part of your body, it <laughs> is your body, you know? And so if, yeah, if you don't have your basic needs met, you're not going to be able to focus. And if you can't focus, you know, you're not going to be able to organize yourself and to remember, you know, tasks or things that you're supposed to do. You'll be forgetful that impacts your job, that impacts everything. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, mental health really does need to be taken more seriously and and not brushed off as some, you know, thing that we just don't talk about because we can't see it or, you know, it's taboo. Yeah, my only fear is that, like, we only care about mental health for the people that can afford it or have the opportunity. You know, that's where it's like, well, I can't believe this person did this. I'm like, they didn't even know how to feed their family. They didn't have a roof over their head. They, yeah. they, they had no in health insurance. Yeah. So it's like we go, well, I can't believe they went and, and did something crazy. But it's like, but we, you, do you, you didn't care, mm-hmm. you know? So, uh, no, again, I applaud what you do. We need more people like you out there, mm-hmm. and uh, you know. Um, but on a lighter note, because I know I almost went into a tangent on that, and I, <laughs> you know, but you know, I, I, because you hit, you hit, you hit such a point with me where I said, where you said like the basic needs aren't there. Mm-hmm. That's so true, you know. So, but I do understand you enjoy to cook. Maybe. What are some? And and I've missed out on this. I missed out big time. You've missed out so much. You know, I think, I hope it wasn't two years in a row. I know I missed in 2020. Was no, there anything in 2020? You missed it two years in a row. So I missed it two in a row. Okay. So we got to yeah. make sure this happens here. Uh, I know you like to cook for a lot of people. What are some, cause I, and you like to do like Puerto Rican dishes, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I cook everything, but I started cooking Puerto Rican food because that's what I grew up around. You know, I have a huge family. And on my mother's side, absolutely everybody knows how to cook and they can cook very well. <laughs> but they also cook very large portions. So like anytime I cook, it it's enough to feed the neighbors basically and my household. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is why I like cooking for large amounts of people rather than a small amount because I feel like it just goes to waste. But um yeah, I grew up cooking Puerto Rican food. Um, I was always around it. You know, I cook arroz con gandules, arroz con habichuelas, pernil, and I cook everything that's traditional. Um, and yeah. And now, then I explain- also like to experiment, you know. <laughs> now, the ones you said, can you explain what those are? Because I'm. I'm going to be a little clueless on that. What exactly are those? Dishes? Arroz con gandules is rice mixed in with like pigeon peas oh okay and it tastes delicious and i think in english it just sounds gross to be honest <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it sounds gross but it tastes very good and it looks really yeah. nice um and so arroz con habichuela is when it's again mixed in rice and beans but then there's also white rice and beans and then there's you know like there's stewed meat and stewed, ch- you know, there's all of these different, um, pernil is pork shoulder. Ooh. Um, you've missed that a few times. <laughs> I, I've missed out big time and I, I got to make sure this does not happen again. I, I know, yeah. I know. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'll cook anything really. Awesome. Awesome. I, myself, not great. I know how to put stuff in the oven. Uh, 
if you want lemon pepper chicken, I can put the lemon pepper on it and throw it in. <laughs> it would be great. Uh, I did get big with seasonings, but I honestly, I just don't know. I, yeah, I couldn't make anything like that. You know, what's funny is I, so I was stranded, um, like locked in my home for a very long time because, well, this is way before the pandemic. There was a, it was blizzard week in Alaska, right? So like I was not going anywhere. Um, and I was kind of running is like running out of things to make. Um, but I had a can of pure pumpkin, like pumpkin puree, you know, what you use for to make Thanksgiving pies and stuff. And I had chicken. And so I made a dish. I made pumpkin chicken and it was, (laughs) it was really good. (laughs) That sounds like, uh, what's the show they used to do? They just give you these ingredients and they're like, just, you have to make something, uh, if anybody that's watching knows, it was on the Food Network. I love that show. Yeah, it's just you just get creative. Oh, with God. What? I don't remember the name of the show, but they give you stuff, and they had to make it from scratch, try to figure it out. It's not Top Chef, right? It's not that. Uh, maybe. I don't know. I so. It was definitely like, I don't know what it was, but it was a good show because you'd be like, I can't believe what these people are coming up with. Mm-hmm. Um, we want to get into the fan questions because uh, we have one that came in a little later. So I'm just going to pull this one up. Uh, but, yeah, because I didn't have it in the original agenda here. Um, okay, we have it. All right, first question. John Robinson, a.k.a. j uh, Did she think she had the highest average uh, batting average for a girl in the pickup summer series. So he's talking about 2020 because we didn't do a summer series last year. Um, And if, and if she, in, if her average, uh, what would she say her average was? Okay. Um, So I don't think I'm that presumptuous. You were hitting really well. Like you were hitting really well. That was pre all of my health issues that I've had recently. But um, yeah. It was was chopped. Thank you, Mike Campbell. Just save the day. It was chopped. I remember that show. I was a big fan of that show. That's probably how I ended up making a <laughs> Um, But yeah, so I don't think I'm that presumptuous to say that I was the best. Um, but I know I was hitting really well. And I remember the first game that I went to of the summer series. Um, you know, a few people in left field just didn't believe <laughs> that I could do what I did. Um but yeah, that's always fun to kind of surprise people, you know. Um, I have no idea what my batting average was. Well, um, we did pretty well because we ended up winning it. Right? I think that's the picture from the summer. Yeah, there's j yeah. right in the middle. <laughs> so this is a pretty good squad right here. I think no, we... this, was the, this was fall. No, this... no, this is summer. I'm pretty nope. sure. That's did I mess funny. this up? Oh well. So that's the the picture from autumn. I know because my hair was. No, finished. I think it. No, I think it went into autumn because I was not on Brandy's team in the next series. Yeah, yeah. No, this was first from the first, like, you know, the first Se- series yeah. we did. Yeah, okay. yeah. But summer went into autumn, and we just kind of kept going. We were we were just trying to make softball alive in Nashville because it was so dead. There was, you know, it, it was, was so the me- the men's league and the women's league went like, let's all play together. <laughs> you know, like and we also have this uh player of the game daisy here uh that year as well i don't know if was this in the playoffs or this is um i don't remember but we, we do have that as well so um now i gotta ask oh we have another we have another statement actually here this isn't a, quite a question i didn't get in the agenda because Ange posted a little later uh, yay, Daisy. I love you so, so much. And it, she, this is all in all caps. She said this, uh, no question, uh, that you are a beautiful soul. I'm blessed to call you my friend. Uh, mm-hmm. bet you didn't know she's a doctor. This chick is bad. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> so I love she's you. A fan. <laughs> I love she's the best. And, uh, uh, former guest of this show was yeah. Ange as well. Yeah, she yeah. she has been uh she'd been in studio it's, uh, it's been over a year, but yeah, no, we all love Ange and um she keeps it she makes it fun. Ange is always having a good time. Yeah. She's always talking. Mm-hmm. Some people get pissed. I don't. I love it. You know but what? I love it. 
she is real. She is a hundred percent herself all the time to everybody, you know, and and she's just so great. Yeah, we definitely love you, Ange. And uh, I just want to say I have two questions follow up because Jero's brought up softball. How did you get into softball? <laughs> it was random. I mean, I remember. I think I was in the back of my parents' car and we were talking about something to do, like an extracurricular activity, right? Um, and I th- I think my dad wanted, was like, oh, do karate. And I'm like, I'll do karate, you know? And so I was like, no, I'm gonna do softball. I had never heard of softball before. <laughs> like I had no reason to pick that. I was just like, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna do this. Um, and I swear it was some type of reverse psychology because he was like in it a hundred percent with me and, you know, practicing me all the time. So I just, I started playing when I was eight and I just never stopped. Later on learned that my mom had actually played, my aunts all played, um, you know, so it was pretty interesting. Um, I have pretty um, athletic family on my dad's side and, you know, some on my mom's as well. Now, now I have to ask because I, I grew up playing baseball. I found slow pitch softball when I got to college. Plymouth State, mm-hmm. I was like, I'm joining the rugby team and I'm finding a softball team. Those are like my two, mm-hmm. it, it, on top of doing like my schoolwork. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> how did you find slow pitch softball? Um. So, yeah, because I did fast pitch and I, you know, I, I was fast pitch pitcher. I did have an injury, um, a track injury on the other foot, not the one that I have my <laughs> on now. Um, and so I had surgery and, um, you know, ended up losing some balance, which made it really tough to, to keep, you know, to, to pitch in the way, because you, it that's the foot that all of the balance goes on, you know? Um, when you pivot and all of that. Um, I don't know, I just, so I did fast pitch throughout and then in college, I honestly didn't really know how to navigate college. I was the first in my family to attend. And so I had no idea that I could, that there was even, like, I just, I didn't know anything about it. Um, And so I feel like I got on everything really late. Anyway, so at UMass Dartmouth, I went for the softball team, but then I was pregnant. Oh, no. (laughs) That didn't work out. Before that, um, you know, I coached JV in Alaska, and I was on a women's team in Alaska, but it was really competitive. And it was supposedly slow pitch. It was modified. It was more modified. (laughs) It was really intense. Um, and we played on rocks or gravel because it was Alaska. <laughs> but then after that, in grad school, I don't know. I, I did slow pitch in grad school. Um, I don't know how I found it. It's just. Just randomly, like, I I, like the only. Then. It's like, where can I find softball? And I just look for it. And, you know, I think that's always been a grounding point for me. So, you know, I've, I've moved around a lot and everywhere I've gone has been, Oh, I, I've never been there before and let me move, you know? Yeah. Um, so the first thing I, I do when I go somewhere new is I find a team and you know, kind of grounds me. Roll with that. No, I, I totally understand that. I mean, I'm not leaving. (laughs) <laughs> I'll never leave New Hampshire. Everybody knows that. I've made it very clear that I'm not leaving this place ever. This is my home. It's where yeah. I enjoy my, my life. Um, what are some of your best softball moments? It could be slow pitch. It could be, you know, your career mm-hmm. before that. You know, is it the friendships? Is it the games? Is it what What are your favorite memories? Oh, my, I think it's definitely the friendships, you know, and the like. there's just – I don't know. There's just, it's, it becomes like softball family, you know, it's, I think that's a huge part of it. Um, I pitched a few no hitters. Those were really great. (laughs) Um, 
memories, you know. Um, but overall, I don't know. There's just something. It's just something about being on the fields where everything else goes away, you know. I don't know. I totally understand it. I mean, obviously, I play almost every night unless I'm working. Mm-hmm. But I, I did. I will say, I thought we had something very special in 2020 because we made something out of nothing. We Thank all were just dying you. to be outside and playing again, you know. Yeah. No, honestly, that felt so different than any other. I think maybe it was treasured more because it just we didn't have it anywhere else. Uh, maybe. I don't know. There was really special though. I remember the first time I, cause I went down and I was like, I, I, you know, I thought I could help with this and, and whatnot. But I remember Schultz, he was like, dude, just come down. Like, I'm like, I know, but I'm just like, I, I never was worried about me getting COVID. It was more about like, do I give it to somebody else or just the panic of, of having it. Yeah. Um, so I was just very like timid. And then I got down and I said, hey, you know what? We're outside. I don't care anymore. <laughs> it was like, you know, yeah. we've been, we've been tortured for the last couple of months here, you know? Yeah. I remember, I think we were all getting stir crazy at that point. Um, Jen's, you know, team and I, or teams, we had had like two practices and then um, everything got shut down. And so there was a while where we just started, we were getting so stir crazy that we started making zoom chats. <laughs> and we'd hang out over Zoom uh, on practice days, right? And days for yeah. doing VP or whatever. Um, and I think we just got so sick of it. We're like, okay, let's just start like little groups, little by like, you know, slowly getting out there. And yeah. You were, not, you know, once like, you know, it was, it was, you know, because it really broke out in about March where the weather's starting to get better. And then it's like you're cooped up in April. And it's like April's like when I want to be mm-hmm. out and about. Then you, you hit May and you're like, uh, I can't be looking out the outdoors. Like, you know, and then June comes around. It's like, I, I can't do this anymore. I, yeah. I'm fine. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll do what I have to do to go in the stores, but Oh my God, let me outside. Like, can't do this. I um, mean, and I remembered I played the first game with a mask. I mean, it, it was hard, <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, and, you know, um, but I think over time we just became our own little pod. Yeah. So it, it wasn't as, or it didn't feel as risky because we were, it was the same group. Yeah. And we never, and we never ran into issues. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I always had my theory about being outside and people could say, Hey Dan, you're wrong or whatever. I'm so over it at this point. So I don't care if people argue with me about it. Uh, but it was, it was a really good time. Yeah. Uh, now we got to get into top fives. So we got some good stuff for you here. And this is one of my favorite segments. We're going into like two of my favorite segments here. Top five got, is hard for me, but okay, let's go. <laughs> yeah, and, and usually people have a cheat sheet on this, so however you want to do it. But we want to know, and, and this helps other people decide what they like. Do you have a top five favorite movies? God, that's so, that's so difficult because there are so many genres. You know what I mean? That's true. Like, how do you pick? And, and I well. Can- like all of them. <laughs> I could wear it like this. You're on you're a deserted island. And I always love this question. I think it's from the office. You're on a deserted island, you can only have five movies and that's it. Mm. So you might, you know, you See, could hit now, every... now one of my top five probably wouldn't make it most oh. <laughs> <laughs> creepy. Yeah. Um, no, I was trying to think about about it and like I love psychological thrillers or anything mysterious, like you know. I, I love that type of thing because I want to figure out the mystery. You know, I want to solve the puzzle basically before. It. And so, um, you know, Shutter Island is, I think, a really, was a really, anyway, psychologically interesting movie. Um, but also would freak me out if I was on an island. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically for that movie. <laughs> right, right, right. So, um, but I don't know. I love musicals. But I also love like mobster movies and things like that. Like it's um, a big kind of span, you know, where, you know, Rent was amazing. And, but I also like Moulin Rouge and I also love like, um, I don't know. I think lately I've been doing more series than anything. Okay. You know, Sopranos is just classic. That's, that's- 
talked a lot about on this show. It's my favorite. Because we, we're going to go into, I think I, oh, I did not put TV shows on for your, oh. uh, for your, I agree with you on Sopranos. The rewatchability is, is high. It is high. Yeah. And then there's the movie, and I can't remember the name of it. It's escaping me. It's about a monster. It's in New York. It's older. Um, how old are we talking? God, it wasn't Gotti, was it? No. Um, I'm big in the Godfather, or no, not the Godfather. I, I know that's probably not, you know. To, um. Um. It's gonna bug me. I'll probably remember later on. Um. Good. Full disclosure, Goodfellas is my all-time favorite movie. Yeah. Next to It's a Wonderful Life. They're like tied. I, I know they couldn't be even more different, but right, right. Uh, that, that's that's where my movie uh, fanhood goes into. But, but also, you know what's a great movie that just, it makes me, it, it's like, it's just so ridiculous and awesome at the same time because it's so Boston is the Boondock Saints. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's one of those what a random, you know. <laughs> and you got the guy from The Walking Dead in there. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Uh, yeah. I haven't watched the show in so long. Uh, Daryl. Daryl, yeah. Yeah. Um, now, this one I'm interested in. Who are your top five favorite musicians? Or bands, or whatever it is. You're, if you, yeah. you, you can only listen to these top fives here. See, that, again, is difficult. There's so many genres. So I... I grew up on salsa and merengue and hip hop. Um, and so, you know, I think salsa and merengue is just like ingrained in me. Uh, so I'd have to say Hector Lavo because he made like he birthed salsa, you know, there's just um, made so much with it and um, actually very pivotal i think point in music uh for latin music for puerto rican music um and i think mark anthony has been kind of his has done the same but for the gen this generation i do yeah. love mark anthony i do love him he's so good yeah <laughs> and, and, and like he's and i say that because like he's not only kept it to the salsa He's also gone into, you know, reggaeton and other types of music, but still maintaining his size on this, I guess. <laughs> um, you know, I think Tupac is legendary, obviously. I love Common. Um, Ooh, that's a first. I love Common. That's yeah. not been thrown out on the show many times. I love underground hip hop. I'm not a fan of what's on the radio, to be completely honest. Um, I love R&B and soul. Um, but then I also love like just straight music. So like Arturo Sandoval and Miles Davis and like jazzy, you know, trumpet, saxophone, that type of thing. I like that too. So. No, no, I totally agree. And yeah, I love the common reference. We have not, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can't forget Celia Cruz. She's also <laughs> but but yeah, common uh, definitely a favorite. Yeah, he he's I know he's not putting out a lot right now, but yeah, he he's 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 one of the all time up there, you know. Mm -hmm. All right, now we're gonna get some interesting ones and anybody watching from softball is gonna be interested in this. Who right now are your top five women softball players? Oh God, <laughs> I don't know. My team, I would say my. No, oh, we could say top five uh, uh, Renegades, right, Lady Renegades? I would say my team, but this is the cool part about my team is that we, I think, all bring something to the table. You know what I mean? Like it, and we all bring our own thing. Um, and I think when come together it just it works um i'm also super appreciative that they've been just they've been there and and kind of welcomed me and let me still play even though i was like going through my health issues and could barely do anything you know and i'm like slowly trying to get back into it um so that's been really nice to have that support 
Um, man, I don't know. I think we all bring something. All right. Who, if you had to give one MVP right no, now. No, I don't do one MVP. <laughs> No, we all bring something. So we got like the power hitters, right? And then we have like the outfielders. We couldn't do anything <laughs> without them. And then, you know what I'm saying? Um, I don't know. I get it. I get it. Don't we have the soul and the spirit. Like, you can't, you can't do that. <laughs> it sounds like Jen, but Jen's doing a good job. Jen, Jen seems to be running the, the team really well. She does, you know, Jen does a lot of good mm-hmm. stuff and she does deserve some credit for that. Yeah, yeah. No, and I like I said, I think, you know, we've all been given a place on the team and, and it's been really nice that, you know, like I'm going through medical stuff that's been hard to keep up with and, you know, I know other players have gone through the same and, and we're all kind of dealing with our own things, but we're all still a part of it and we're doing really well. <laughs> My it's, it's, and that's what makes good teams it's picking each other up when when you are having those difficult times so yeah. uh do you have a, a top five pit nashua pickup players, pick up players during the last two years that that stood out to you this is hard to i mean hmm or just anybody that's anybody that like, stuck out i feel like brandy's always gonna die no matter what she's gonna give it her all right can't go wrong with that. Um, Schultz with the bat, <laughs> right? <laughs> She's great. Um, trying to think. I think that can't be. I mean, can't be anywhere without pitchers either, right? Um, it's there's so many. I'm Ooh, who's the standout pitcher? That's a good. Yeah, that's that is thinking. Because we mix it up so many times. Thank I thought Mano did a good job. Kyle. Mano. Uh, uh, who else had pitched? Yeah, Jim has pitched out there. Uh, people are going to be pissed because I can't think. Uh, now I can't think of it. I put you on the spot. You did? Which is, yeah. my, which is my job. So I don't have to be on the spot. No, but there's, <laughs> isn't there someone from your team that's pitched before? Uh, I'm trying to, who, all right, who would have pitched in this series on here? It must have been Jim or Colette. She must have pitched at least a couple times. We got Dolan there, too. Oh, my goodness, yeah. this guy right here. Who? Is it, is it Lucas? No. Oh, yeah, Lucas. Yeah, I haven't seen him in a little while. Yeah. I don't I, I can't remember. I guess I can't remember who's pitched. I know the ones I've said, I know for sure have. So anybody watching this uh, that wants to throw out any of the uh, pitches from the, uh, who was it? Rob. Rob Yes, Rob did. And Rob's leaving us for Florida, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, this one's, I want to go into my favorite segment of the show here, which is blank versus blank. There's no prep for this. I'm going to give you two things. You got to pick one. You got to tell me why. Uh, first one I have, and I ask this one a lot cause I'm always curious what people will say. Michael Jackson or Prince? Yeah. It's not, these aren't easy. These are the hard hitting questions here. But why choose? <laughs> you gotta choose one. You gotta pick one. I don't know. I don't know. Wow. Maybe Michael Jackson, I guess. You feel like he has more hits or because that's the why is the tough part here, Daisy. That's the, mm-hmm. that's the hard part. <laughs> I feel like they're both kind of legendary, you know? And yes. um, yeah. The dancing too. Yeah. I'll go so with we, MJ. Okay. That's fair enough. I would go with MJ too. And I love Prince. Yeah. And I know Stevie wonder said if, if, if MJ was the, king of pop he goes then prince was the emperor but i still i like more michael jackson songs yeah honest. i mean i think he just did so much with music and with dancing and and that i think just impacted so much with music uh two singers that died very young unfortunately um one murdered by her manager selena mm-hmm. one died a uh, plane crash Aaliyah. Uh, mm-hmm. Selena or Aaliyah. I love them both. 
I love them both, but I'm going Selena. I kind of figured that, but I had to ask. <laughs> and I love Leah, but yeah, yeah. She was also kind of doing something big too. Like, I don't know. It's just very. Um, pivotal. Their careers are going this way. Yeah, and they and then and they were just really impactful and pivotal in music for, um, especially Latin music in the U.S. I have to ask this question because we're going to get into it. I just want to ask your opinion on this. And nobody wants to die young, obviously. Mm-hmm. But in the music industry or the film industry, and you never make that bad album or do that bad movie, do you become more legendary? Because, I mean, we have some other ones in here that I'm going to ask you. Mm-hmm. But like even Kurt Cobain mm-hmm. never had that bad album. It is is does that solidify you like immortality? Like, and people are always gonna be like, you're one of the best of all time because, you know, Jay-Z and Nas, I look at them, they've put out bad stuff as mm-hmm. they got older. I These that. artists never had that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I think it does kind of safeguard them in some way. Right. Because we want to kind of like, if they've given nothing but amazing stuff and then they're gone, I mean, yeah, I think they're kind of immortalized and in a way, you know? Yeah, no, I a hundred percent agree. And I keep asking that question because I think about it a lot. I'm like, man, they, they just put out a lot of good stuff and then they were just taken so early, which is right. horrible. But like the immortality of it is, is pretty unreal. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you a very difficult question. Oh goodness! Okay. And this 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 is one I ask every guest their first time on the show. Who is more responsible for the success of the New England Patriots over the last twenty years, Tom Brady or Bill Belichick? Oh my goodness! Okay. Last week I asked this one first. I was like, I'm getting it out of the way. <laughs> so. I have no idea. I mean, so I don't think you know. I I think that. You need both. This is one of those things like you need both. Um, yes, Brady is great, right? But one person is not the entire team, you know? And I know a lot of people will disagree with me on that. But yeah, this, this always, is why it's a tough question. <laughs> a lot of people will disagree with me on that. But one person doesn't make a team, um, you know, even though he's amazing. It just – he. One person doesn't make the team. So are you picking Belichick? I'm not saying I like the guy. <laughs> no, no. I'm just saying who's more responsible. Do you think it's the guy that gets the groceries or the player on the field? No, I mean, I think the players, right? Because they're doing yeah. their thing. But, um, you know, yeah. So you're but one person is in a team. Which I get. But the coach, and he's, he's the GM. Mm-hmm. is he more responsible for that because he's putting the players around him or is it, you got to have the quarterback to do it. This is where this question gets so hard. This is like the chicken or the egg though. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because yeah. right. In this case, the egg would be the team, right? The coach is putting the team together and figuring out what works and, you know, kind of assembling them and, and, and all of that. The players put in all the work though, right? They put uh, so in now, the practice, they put in all the work, they do all that. Um, you know, but I think the coach is so responsible for making them a team or, or at least bringing them together and getting them to come together as a team because you can pick a bunch of great players from all over and throw them on a field and they're not going to play well, even though they're great, unless they've had some time to kind of become, you know, that family, that team. So you're picking Belichick is what I'm taking. I don't know. I think that I'm very, this is this why it's a tough question. You got to pick one, but see, I'm very like in the the middle (laughs) with all of these questions. (laughs) This is why this is the toughest segment on the show, which is why it's my favorite. Oh, God. Okay. So, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know. What do you think? All right. I'm curious. What do you think? 
I've always said Belichick. Really? I've always, yep, that has not changed with me. Uh, I've had other people come on the show and say Brady, which is fine, but I figure yeah. this is one of the better questions that we have. Yeah. And I feel like that's where you're leaning is Belichick. Yeah, because then, okay, let's say you say it's the player. Well, guess what? The player's gone now. And He's one player, but he was like your, your, your quarterback, your right. biggest well, piece on that. the field. Yeah. Still, right? You know, uh, I've always thought, like, yes, the quarterback is essential, but I've always thought it was really unfair that other players weren't kind of given – as much credit, you know what I mean? No, I mean they—they they were at different times. So, all right. Right. So, okay, I'm going Belichick because. All you know, right. I, <laughs> I, I and I agree with you, at yeah. least where I'm coming from. I'll give you—I'll give you an easier one. This is a candy Thank question you. here. Two, my two yeah. favorite candies here. It's a okay. candy question. Would you rather have Skittles or Sour Patch Kids? Ooh, Skittles, but I like Sour Patch Kids. But I'll go Skittles. Okay, fair enough. Because uh, gooeyness. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm torn between the two. So, mm-hmm. um, now you like cooking, but would you rather cook or go to like a restaurant and eat someone else's cooking? Um, I think it's nice to eat out. Sometimes, you know, life gets busy. Yeah. I like cooking for people, for events, like for bigger, you know, things like that. But I also like trying new food. All right, fair enough. All right, here's one that I want to know as a wrestling fan. Okay. Stone Cold Steve Austin or The Rock? Ooh. See, I, so I watched wrestling for many years, but I did not watch The Rock. I only watched really? Steve Austin. And I actually met his brother. Oh, no way. Yeah. In Alaska. (laughs) I could see his brother being there. (laughs) Yeah. um, Very random. (laughs) At a movie theater, of all things. But, um, yeah. So, I guess I'll go Stone Cold, just because I never really saw The Rock. Do you like The Rock's movies or no? I'm not a big fan of them. I mean, I think they're funny. But, Yeah. I like Moana. <laughs> You're welcome. My niece loves that song. Yes. Oh my gosh. That was a great movie. So I think that would be my favorite movie of his. Okay. All right. Fair mm-hmm. enough. I think I now know the answer to this just because of what you said on musicians, but Tupac or Biggie? Tupac. Yeah. You know, and I remember <laughs> um, I was an undergrad in Miami and the entire like there was this common room and the first floor of, of like towers of dorms um and there was i mean the biggest debate and literally the room was divided the east coast kids oh god here we go west coast and i think i was the only east coast person to say tupac who was kind of an East Coast guy, though. Right? But, like, but I know he, he traveled I over. Yeah. Massive Tupac, but yeah. <laughs> um, I love them both. Tupac, I, Ready to Die is my favorite album, but I like Tupac's music overall better. Mm-hmm. Uh, crazy story Ange Deshard told me, which I wish she told me uh, when she was on the show. She saw Biggie actually perform, which no, is like okay. crazy to think about because he died in 97. She said, like, she was, I don't know if she was underage or whatnot, but she actually got to see him perform. Wow. Which, man, if she had a digital camera at the time or a phone, you know, I'm sure, I wonder if she had a phone at all or not a phone, but um, I think we were using disposable cameras back then. (laughs) What a a picture that would have been to take. Right. Um, Yeah. Have you seen Dave Chappelle's block party? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. Were you there? No, but I I saw it and I was just, you know, they, they kind of tour where Biggie lived and and all of that. And I mean, uh, to have anything to like see him or Mm -hmm. Tupac is like 
probably unheard of at this point. I mean, I'm sure yeah. there's people exist that have that stuff, but like, could you imagine? Like, if Ange is watching still, that's that's a pretty big deal that you got to see that. that is, <laughs> you know what's really awesome about her not having the camera or the phone or whatever is that she just got to be in it and be present, True. which I don't think you know you see concerts now and all you see are the phones no one's just enjoying it i think it's hard though like because the people want to take like now that there are cameras like people want to enjoy it in the moment mm -hmm. but they also want to go back and re-watch it if right. they want to take a, a video or what i mean could you imagine being at live aid and seeing queen and freddie mm -hmm. mercury putting on this amazing performance and being able to watch it from your own phone after like that, that's so, unheard of. That, that would have been an amazing concert. So, um, oh, Live Aid? Uh, I literally rewatch that all the time, being like, man, he had this whole crowd in the palm of his hand. Yeah. It's 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 unreal to think about, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's just so... Oh, yeah. Some people just can... Yeah, music is a powerful thing. Really. 100% agree. And uh, just there's just something about that performance that uh, it's going to yeah. live forever, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, more. Yeah. So, um, because I was, I started thinking about Dave Chappelle's Block Party. Um, so Lauren Hill's in it. Sade's in it. Um, so is Jill Scott. And I love Jill Scott. I love Lauren. Lauren Hill. Yes. Yeah, I love all of them. Um, the thing, <laughs> Jill Scott saying about eggs and toast and orange juice and it sounded phenomenal right and it's <laughs> like you're, you're sitting there like oh my goodness but it you know that's how powerful music is so you could sing about breakfast and it's amazing they're still gonna love it yeah now music is an unbelievable thing and um i like those artists I, I, was erica badu not there i don't know if she's still what? making i said shade i meant erica badu not shade oh okay that's that's what i was thinking I loved Eric about. I mean, and she had an album out in 2004 that was just unbelievable. And uh, I don't know what I did with it, but even better than like On and On in '97. Like she was just unbelievable. That was her own beautiful thing. <laughs> Hundred percent agree. Uh, easier question though. If you wanted a sports drink, what would you rather, Gatorade or Powerade? I know Gatorade. they're yeah. Gatorade. going Gatorade. Mm -hmm. They are very different. Can they I just, I just want to put that out there? <laughs> they taste completely different to me. I actually worked with a psychiatrist who went to University of Miami, which is where Gatorade was made. And like, I don't know, knew all this stuff about the team that had made it. It was pretty, but Gatorade I think is better. It's light. I feel like it's lighter. Like I had a Powerade today and I was like, Gatorade is just like lighter. Yeah. You know, and obviously I think Powerade kind of like came around after. It did. Yeah. So, all right. Toughest one in blank versus blank. Final question here. Better coach in the pickup series in 2020. <laughs> James by Lois or Craig Pelletier? Ooh, you know what? Sorry, Jen. I love you, Jen. <laughs> Craig was my coach both times. Um, also, I'm going to not pick Freddy Krueger ever. <laughs> yes, that's right. With Myers versus Freddy. I'm yeah. always team Myers. Actually, I think I was on Freddy, team Freddy at one point. No, for the last, the last series I was on team Freddy, but I'm still team Myers at heart. I always will be. Um, <laughs> Myers is just better than Freddy Krueger. I just, there's no convincing me otherwise. There's no Freddy Krueger without Michael Myers. There's no Jason Voorhees without Michael Myers. He was the first. Yeah. So I definitely agree. But they're both great people. We love Jen. We love Craig. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad that, you know, to be friends with both of them. So, but yeah, no, no, Daisy, I really appreciate this. This has been a blast. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to do this another time. Maybe once you're healed, we can have you in the studio. You know, <laughs> yeah, ideally. <I'm> driving again. <laughs> Yeah, you know, once once that's that's good to go. So, no, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, tomorrow we are going to go in the studio. We're going to have a show because uh, we want to use that time. But uh, I want everybody out there to keep your heads up. Have a great week. And until next time, let freedom ring. Thank you.